Does everything have a bright side to it? Of course. It doesn't always outweigh the negatives, but everything has a bright side to it. This makes happiness a choice. And here we say that the discipline of being happy is the ultimate discipline. With that said, welcome to the Ultimate Discipline Podcast, where we meet with people who are practitioners of this exact discipline, and we hear their cool stories of cultivating happiness through challenges in their life. I am your host, Sean Greenspan. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. I am so excited for today's guest, Gay Hendricks. Uh, for those that don't know, he is the author of The Big Leap, a wonderful book. If you're looking for a book that is going to help you understand why you have certain patterns going on in your life that you might not be so happy with, um, or you're looking to kind of like push those ideas further um, or push, push those you know opportunities in your life further, I highly recommend it. We're going to dive into that book and all the other areas that you know Gay is experienced in. And Gay, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate you joining me today. Well, thanks a lot, Sean. It's been a real pleasure being with you. And uh, I really um, look forward to what we can invent together. I don't know exactly what we're talking about today. Um, I know we're talking about the big leap, but I understand you also have an interest in happiness. Is that correct? That is, that is, um, that's kind of, that's kind of why I gravitate towards these books and topics. Uh, you know, I think happiness is something that we can work at. I think it's something that there's such a high, there's such a high level to experiencing happiness and it's a little more complex. Um, so I love to hear about other people's experience with it. And I think there's factors that affect it you know, like our success and, you know, things like that. So um, that is, uh, yeah, that is the name of the podcast, actually. Happiness, life's ultimate discipline. And I really, yeah. I really am glad you see it that way, though, because um, uh, I actually think of happiness as a life work. You know, it's, it's hmm. really, I mean, if you even look in the, uh, founding documents of the United States, it says we're dedicated to the pursuit of happiness. And the interesting thing was in those times, pursuit didn't mean chasing something. Pursuit meant your occupation. So the pursuit of accounting or the pursuit of law or the pursuit wow. of teaching. So it meant that your job is happiness. And I think that's a good way to look at it because Every day you have the opportunity. See, I think happiness is partly a matter of choice. I don't know if you look at it that way, but at some point a person has to choose to be happy or choose mm -hmm. to stay happy. That it's a matter of coming to choices. And like, I can remember before I made a, a real commitment to being happy, which I did when I was 24 years old, I was overweight. I smoked heavily. I was in a terrible relationship. I had a crappy job. Didn't even like my car. <laughs> you know, like everything was <laughs> wrong with my life. And I, I realized that I'd gotten that way by a series of terrible choices that took me away mm. from myself. You know, like the choice to put 40 cigarettes in my mouth and smoke them every day or the yeah. choice to eat a cheeseburger fries and a vanilla malt instead of having a Cobb salad for lunch. And, <laughs> and I had just learned to live in those set of bad choices. And then I had this one miracle wake up day when I was 24 years old, 1969, I'm sure well before you were born, uh, but back there was a world before your birth, believe it or not. And uh, in that world in 1969, I was 24 years old and get this, like today I weigh 180 pounds. I'm six feet tall. Mm. In 1969, I had gained weight up to 300 pounds. I weighed 120 some pounds more than I weigh now. 
And wow. I had I had this big moment of realization that I had created my life through this set of bad choices, and I needed to make a commitment to a new way of being. And so I made this commitment to bringing forth what I call pure consciousness, which is just the celebration of being a human being. You know, just the feeling, the good feeling about being in life itself. So kind of happiness from the core, from the inside out. And I made a commitment to that. And within the next year, I'd lost more than 100 pounds. I uh, also had always worn glasses since I was in the third grade. And my eyesight even changed. So I was able to get rid of my glasses. I was able to pass my driving test for the first time since I was 16 without my glasses on. And that was a big achievement for me because I'd always had to wear corrective lenses that said on my driver's license. So I've never had to do that ever since. And the other thing that cleared up during that magic year after I had that moment of enlightenment was I got out of the relationship I'd been in and then I was single for seven years, but I think I needed seven years to recover from the toxicity of that relationship. It was a very painful few years of my life. And so I was then single up until I was in my 30s uh, when I had the miracle of meeting my wife, Katie. Now we've been together for 42 years and uh, just Congratulations. every day gets better and better and better and more celebratory. Congrats on the 42 years. Gay. What was that moment of enlightenment like? Well, I'll tell you, it was um, it was out of the blue. I don't know if you know that saying, but it was came out of nowhere yep. because, okay, remember, I'm 300 pounds. I'm puffing on two or three packs of Marlboros a day. I'm in this bad relationship. And it was in the middle of winter in New Hampshire. And I was working at a small boarding school for juvenile delinquents. And uh, I was called a teacher, <laughs> but I was more or less a wrangler. And because uh, to ride herd on these kids was a, was a tough kind of 24 hour a day job because I lived on the campus also. So it was a really tough job. And I had all this argument stuff going with my then partner, Linda, and we had this huge blowout argument one Sunday afternoon. And I went out for a walk to kind of clear my head after the argument. And it had recently snowed and I stepped on a place where there was a pile of snow, but underneath it was a patch of ice. And my feet shot out from under me and I went whoom down on my back. Now 300 pounds is approximately what a refrigerator weighs. So picture a refrigerator going bam down on the pavement. And I literally bounced when I hit the pavement <sighs> and it just not, it didn't knock me out unconscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It knocked me conscious in the sense that it jolted woke me out of up, my right? normal way of, yeah, it woke me up. It, what happened specifically was for about two minutes, I saw who I really was instead of, you know, who I unconsciously really was. I could see down through myself, I had these layers of anger about things that had happened, my father dying, and my father died just before I was born, and so I never get to know him, and so I felt a lot of pain about that, and I also felt a lot of sadness about that, in addition to anger about that, and I could feel how I had these layers of feeling in me. Down at the bottom of the layers was fear, like just the fear of dying and the fear of, I don't know what all now, but uh, just all this big bundle of ball of fear that I was carrying around in my belly, it felt like a hard knot. But then here's the magic thing that happened. As I felt my way down through all those old feelings, I came to a place at the center of myself, which I just, I call pure consciousness, because it was in the background of everything. It was like the, the who I really was. And I realized that I wasn't my programming. You know, if I'd lived in the family next door, maybe I would have been five feet, eight and skinny. 
you know, or if I'd lived two blocks down the street, I might have been six foot seven and weighed 270 pounds, you know, so I, there was all these different things that are layered on by family and programming and things like that. But I realized that who we are is way down there at the center of ourselves in the form of that pure consciousness. And I was reborn in that moment. I realized that's where my spirituality was also that I could feel how that that was me as a spiritual being, that pure consciousness. And in that moment, I realized something I felt that, that later I would um, hear Wayne Dyer say, you know, like 50 years later, he, he would say that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We're not human beings having a spiritual <laughs> experience. And I yeah. felt that in that very moment and have since carried that around with me ever since. And so that was a tremendous moment of rebirth. And here's what I did. I said, as I was coming back out of that experience, I realized, oh, I'm cold. I'm laying in the ice in the middle of a road. I'm, uh, I got to go back home because I'm cold. I want a cigarette. Oh, I still weigh 300 pounds. You know, all of these realizations, it was like waking up from a dream back into reality. But here's what I did. I said, I commit to doing whatever I need to do in order to live in that state of pure consciousness all the time. Wow. That was my big, bold request of the universe. And so as I came out of that experience, I walked my 300 pound body back home and I went back into that house <laughs> and faced the relationship I was in but everything had changed because I realized oh I've had this experience but now I can change everything and it came down to moment by moment choices my first choice was to start eating things that fed my spirit rather than my 300 pound body and I don't know if yeah. you're a big believer in nutrition, but I've become an absolute zealot about what I put in my body over the last 50 years. Because, you know, here I am, 180 pounds. I'm 77 year old. I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. I work out at the gym three days a week and I play squash and I play golf and uh, I ride my bicycle and I go for long walks with my wife and I am having the time of my life. And I think it started with that choice twenty four uh, when I was 24 years old. That is outstanding. Uh, I got to celebrate that. I, I want to tell you longevity and not just living more days, living more days quality is what I just, I, I, I hope to aspire and I hope to inspire as many people as possible um, along that way. S it's interesting Th this this got kicked off with you asking about if I think happiness is a choice mm. and that's what we talked about in the beginning that kind of spiraled here and I do think happiness is a choice and you said do you think happiness is a choice or you said you know happiness it's a choice to be happy and stay happy um, I definitely think both of those right I, I often think to be happy could happen by accident, right? You know, it, it, we could just be happy. And staying happy um, generally is going to take a, com a commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that what, what grounds me is to think that I don't know the future and to look at the bright side of everything because the second you hit the ground, bam, before you were in, had your enlightened experience, that's a horrible situation. You slipped and hurt yourself. You could have broke your head. Maybe you have internal bleeding. Who knows what's going on? It's weird to think that slipping and falling is the best thing that happened to you in your life. Yeah. And well, that's, always... that's what keeps me. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, that's what keeps me going, right? Um, I've you know, had in relationships, maybe work, personal friend that, you know, have ended or, you know, things that have happened, you know, to family members that you just don't know what the outcome is going to be. So that's where I look at the, the choice of happiness. Yeah, I very much agree. I, um, I think that one of the most important things in life um, is 
getting clear on what you can control and what you can't control. And there are two gigantic things that people obsess about and worry about. One is things that happened in the past, which you have absolutely no control over, and things that are going to happen in the future, which you have no control over. Sure, you can plan and things like that, and uh, you can do things that will make your future better probably, but you can't tell exactly what's going on and because it's out of our control. And there was a, a philosopher, Epictetus, about 2000 years ago, who was kind of like the most popular philosopher of his time. And the first line of his book that they wrote down about what his sayings were is that the secret of happiness You'll like this, Sean. The secret of happiness is knowing that there are some things you can control and some things you cannot. And if that sounds familiar, you know, the serenity prayer. You know, God grant me the <laughs> ability just... to, to not control. I, I can't remember how it goes exactly, but um, uh, what is so that idea? My dad will be upset with me because he says that all the time. God grant me the ability to, yeah, it, it's along the lines of controlling what you can control. And it's funny, the serenity prayer, that's my dad's go-to. He has it written down. And my mom, my whole life told me, control what you can control. And that's, that's what I was, was raised on. Um, it's beautiful. You know, I've, the, the quote I've heard about like happiness as kind of like a formula, like in the most simplest term. Um, what is that happiness is reality minus your expectations. And I think that plays into a factor of, of the forward looking, right? Like if you have certain expectations, right? You know, you're, you could be, you could be setting yourself up for uh, a different experience than you're going to, you know, go through. And I guess, I guess living in the moment, right? Ex dedicating your life to this consciousness that is that is to me what i see as a general theme amongst many people that i i, I believe in and i love reading about talking to and i'd love to know in this commitment towards that what are some things that you have done oh my goodness um that year of losing the hundred and some pounds and quitting smoking and <clears throat> excuse me let me take a sip of water please we're in no rush here i live in a very dry part of the world very <clears throat> constantly where are you calling from water i live in southern california in a Beautiful. kind of a desert mountain valley about 11 miles from the ocean called ojai o-j-a-i it's paradise on earth, but it's hot and dry at this season of the year. Um, some of the things I've done in terms of some of the disciplines I've followed, I'm a daily meditator. Um, I have started, I started meditating in 1972. And so it, here it is 2022. So I've been a daily meditator now for 50 years. And that means that twice a day I go in a room by myself or with my wife sitting beside me. She meditates too. And we go inside for 20 minutes or so. And it's kind of like taking a shower for your soul. You know, it just cleanses things inside. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that's my mainstay, I would say, on a daily basis. Also, for the past 42 years, the discipline of being in a close relationship and wanting to have every moment be in the radiant present, in a loving present, but also in relationships that doesn't happen all the time. You know, and so Katie and I started writing relationship books way back in the 1980s, because we wanted to keep track of the things that we did that were working. And then we started sharing that with other couples. And as we were both psychologists, and then one magic day, an up and coming young talk show host named Oprah Winfrey called and said, hey, I've been hearing good things about you guys. Uh, you have a new book out, come on my show. And so we ended up uh, getting to debut our book, Conscious Loving on Oprah, which is 
the best possible place at the time to yeah. talk about your book because it kind of made made us internationally famous overnight. And wow. so life went from zero to sixty very quickly. Well, I'd say from thirty to sixty, <laughs> we were already doing great. <laughs> but uh, there's a difference between working with ten couples in your living room and working with ten million people on Oprah. You know, on the Oprah. energy is outrageous <laughs> and. Uh, Sometimes people ask me what it's like to be on a big show like Oprah. And I said, well, you can feel the same feeling. Go down to the coffee shop and order 10 shots of espresso and drink it. And then for the next hour, you can feel what it's like to be on Oprah. <laughs> you know, a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, but the, the best thing was, it, you know, introduced our book to millions of um, people. We were both, uh, Katie was in private practice and I was a university professor at the time. Uh, when Oprah struck. And so uh, oh, after a few years, we set up our own institute, which we still have uh, to this day, the Hendricks Institute. And so we kind of have our own little private university where we train a couple of hundred coaches every year, therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists and folks like that. And uh, we train them in our form of body-centered transformation, as well as our form of relationship work. I could only imagine what that experience was like being on Oprah. I re I really could, and and I think you know you you brought that into yourself. You know, you obviously put that energy out and continued to deliver value to people that they were talking about you, and that's that's just outstanding. And next time I'm in Southern California, I'll, I'll uh, give you a shout and I'll come by and see what the paradise is about. <laughs> oh yeah, this is so beautiful here. And Katie and I, we live on an acre that has um, six or seven ancient oak trees. I mean, really, that go back 300 years. Uh, we have one oak tree that's 350 years old, wow. according to the local arborist. Um, but we have also taken out all the grass and put in things that don't require water, like succulents and um a very slow growing grass that only needs a tiny amount of water. And so we're very proud of, uh, and we have solar energy here. So, uh, which is great at the time because it's gonna be a hundred degrees here in the not too distant future. And that's when we like to have the air conditioner on. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could imagine. Um, so it sounds like, it sounds like, you know, healthy eating, healthy relationships, moving your body and showering your mind, if you will, are uh, some of the things that you've been focusing on. And, you know, it's, it's funny because you, you, you first, you first become aware of trying to make a change for some reason, then you kind of, you kind of hear things, you know, oh, be in the present moment. And then it comes to a point where you need to practice and realize it for yourself. Like you can only hear it so many times before you experience it. And sometimes we have that experience and we don't even, we, we don't learn from it. Like, you know, you, that's why I asked about what, what did it feel like to be enlightened? Right. You know, that's a, that's a obviously, you know, or to have that enlightened moment, right. You know, that was a, a huge experience for you. And yeah, it's just, it's always fun to hear the way that people like work through it themselves. And that's actually what, that's a, a question I want to ask about the big leap. So for those that don't know, the big leap talks about overcoming your upper limit problem. And what that really is, is you getting in your own way, if you will, you know, you stopping yourself, um, you know, if you see patterns and, you know, please dive into the book. I've read se several of these and they're great. But if you see patterns of making a lot of money and then losing it, getting in good relate or, you know, things go up and things go down, right? It's, it's often ourselves that are doing this, you know, bring this upon ourselves. And, you know, Gay, something that I found that I came across that theory a little bit younger and I found it was very difficult on my ego to understand that these things that might not be so good in my life were caused by me, <laughs> yes. right? That's, that's not an easy pill to swallow. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering if, I don't know, you know, I'm wondering if you, if you, I mean, obviously if you've, you've thought about that deeply and you try to help so many people, what, what, 
Like, what would you say for someone, you know, that might not even be open to that concept? Well, uh, let me tell you a quick story that will illustrate uh, the point I want to make. And that is, I once had a man come in and he was in his 30s. And he said, I call it the greatest one liner I've ever heard as a therapist. Uh, he said that since the time he was a teenager, he had counted up and he had had 17 different relationships that all started very promising. And then after six months or so, it would blow up and the person would disappear. And he asked me, he said, I'm beginning to think it has something to do with me. You know, because 17 times this had happened and he would blamed it on the other person. And he just thought, well, that's women for you. But it was like something out of a textbook. All I had to do was ask him, tell me a little bit yep. about your younger life. And here's the story he told that when he was six months old, his mother had left and he had three other brothers and yeah. his mother had run off with another man and the father never remarried and spent my client's whole childhood talking about how you can't trust women, they'll always leave you, don't ever trust a woman, son. And this guy had this so full of his head that he just created one relationship after another that that occurred with that same template. So you could say he had never had a relationship in, in his life because that old pattern of his father's, he was replaying his father's relationship with women, not anything to do with what he wanted and needed. And so it only took an hour's work for him to realize that because he was ripe to realize it. Here we say that the universe is happy to teach you by tickling you with a feather, but it's equally happy to teach you by banging you over the head um, with a mallet if you're not paying attention. And I've had both, like that moment of slamming down on the ice. That was a whang on the head from the universe saying, wake up, boy. And fortunately, I did, because I don't think I would have lasted long if I would continued with my old patterns. But But here's the thing which is that we've all got these old limiting beliefs that hold you back. Sometimes the limiting belief is very deep in there and something like, I don't deserve love or I don't deserve the good things of life. I've done something so bad that I'm terminally doomed to having a bad life. That's a common one. Another common one is, I don't believe I have the right to shine, to be fully acknowledged, to be seen. And so I keep my, my genius tucked inside. So there are only a few limiting beliefs, mm. but that they have a grip on just about everybody. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Gay. And it's, uh, okay, so I'll tell you where I've come across this before. I, I've I've come across this with uh, oh really good friends of mine Heather and Kent McKean they they have something called the Mind Change Institute and this is what they talk about um, they they talk about that people have these limiting beliefs that we we need to overcome and I'm actually currently going through their program uh, and it, it's you know it, it's similar to that and a question that I would have for for you is you know where would someone maybe like myself start searching internally searching right and what i mean by that gay is i don't have i don't know how to say this um, i don't have an obvious problem that doesn't mean I don't have a problem. Maybe it just means I haven't searched or done enough inner work, but I don't have that. Every relationship has stopped at six months or um, something like that. But I, I, I have a deep, my problem is I have a deep, deep truth inside of me that there is a higher level of awareness 
and consciousness that we can attain and I'm searching for it. That's, you know, you know, cause I guess an easier way to ask that question. Sometimes you hear people that say like, you know, every time they start, you know, making money, they lose it. Every time they start losing weight, they get back into old habits. So, you know, um, I know that's a, that's a difficult question, but I love that. Like, I just love the concept of what you said so much and want to figure out how I can apply it. And of course, as many people as possible can. Yeah, well, you just have to start looking where you are. Like, are you satisfied with the flow of love in the close relationship or close relationships you have? You know, just kind of assessing yourself that way. You don't have to be sick in order to get better. You know, that's something that I want everybody to know. There doesn't have to be anything wrong with you in order to grow because that's what personal growth is all about. You don't have to declare yourself as a problem or anything. Thank you so, for saying that. Thank you for saying that. I am sorry to cut you off, but um, it just goes to show that my ego gets in the way there, right? Because I'm like, you know, you want to say like, I don't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we've all got limits on our, uh, see, at the end of the day, let's say you're at the end of your life 50 years from now or however long it is. Um, and if I came by and I asked you, hey, was your life a complete success? And let's say you said yes. And let's say I said, well, tell me, what was at the very top? I bet you'd say something that had to do with love. Because a lot of people at the end of their life are assessing mm -hmm. the extent to which they learn to love and learn to give love as well as receive love. But oftentimes people are limited on the receiving end. They don't let themselves really be open and per permeable to the amount of love that's kind, that's trying to be expressed to them all the time. So start with your own inner, inner journey by asking what I call wonder questions like, hmm, how could I open up a greater flow of love in myself? And hmm, how can I open up a greater flow of creative energy in myself? Asking that question is part of the healing process because to ask that question means you've become humble enough to receive the answers. Because wonder is the gateway to really being humble and asking a question. Because when you're wondering, you're wondering about something you don't know and you'd really like to know. You know, like if a, like Katie asked me uh, last night, she said, what would you like for lunch tomorrow? She loves to cook and she uh, she's usually makes us one meal a day in the middle of the day and we don't eat dinner. Um, we might have a snack in the evening, but we don't eat dinner because I like to wake up feeling in the morning, you know, and I don't I don't sleep well if I have a heavy meal inside me. Uh, so anyway, Katie asked me, what would you like for lunch tomorrow? And she named off a couple of things and Hmm, they both sounded good, but I had this moment of, hmm, 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 what would I really like? And immediately I came up with the answer that I'd like a piece of lean, fresh fish and some spinach. And she loves to make both of those. So we're going to have yeah. lean, fresh fish and spinach for lunch today. But it came out of wonder. And wonder is the key to your creativity because the moment you wonder, you're stepping out of the known into the field of the unknown. Hmm. How can I express more love in my life? That's a genuine wonder question that opens up miracles. The moment you even ask the question, it means you're humble enough to receive that next level of love and abundance in your life. Wonder. It really is beautiful, right? And something about wonder and let, I can, I think curiosity could go along with wonder. It almost makes you become optimistic and a dreamer, right? And live in this unconfined area, right? Where, you know, 
you're, you're searching, you know, there's an answer out there, you know, there's something you love for lunch, something that's just going to make you feel great and, you know, feed your soul, right? Not just your, your body. And, you know, that's, that's really, you know, that's really beautiful. So I, I just listened to a podcast two days ago, um, all about living in the flow state. I think that's um, pretty similar to kind of what you were talking about. People talk about flow state being fully submerged in an activity. You lose track of time, your creativity spikes. And they said that the first step was curiosity. Mm, so it's really interesting it. to hear you say that. And then, you know, and then it evolves into um, at the last one was mastery. I would I would need to go back and look at like what what you know they all entail, but curiosity. I wonder why people don't tap into that more. I think I think it comes from not choosing to be happy, like you said, because a lot of times, like curiosity, you know, it's like it's like looking for like the best solution out there. Like you like there, it's being it's hopeful, it's spiritual, right? You know, I it seems like, like on paper, it seems like a fun, easy thing, but a lot of people, you know, me included, sometimes look at things not like as work more than like, you know, looking at something with like a curious, abundant outlook, right? Yeah, I think curiosity, wonder, pure interest are really naturally healing things that are good for us as individuals and good for us in relationship too. One of the best compliments my wife ever paid me early in our relationship, she said, you're not only the most interesting person I've ever met, you're by far the most interested. And to me, that was a really deep seeing of me because, um, I've always been very interested in life. You know, what makes us tick? Who are we? What is the being of a human being? Do we even know yet? You know, and so um, that's been a subject of fascination with me ever since I can remember. I was always the kid in school that was irritating my teachers by asking why, <laughs> why all the time. <laughs> And I must have asked, driven my mother nuts with a thousand why, you know, why, why do we do that? Or, why is it that blah blah blah? Yeah, so, yeah uh, right. I, I, I think a, a healthy wonder muscle is a good thing to develop. Hmm. I it, I I love your vernacular, a wonder muscle. <laughs> um, my path here, gay, has been led through athletics and fitness. Um, that's an area I feel self actualized in. Right, I can get into the zone and get into the flow through fitness and activity quickly. I can, I can, I love any type of movement. I know how to care for my body. I know I need to push hard. You know, knowing when to push hard is a difficult thing because we always want to not push hard, right? And I know when to kind of like back off. And I haven't felt that way with the mind, but I did learn through, uh, really through weightlifting, playing sports, running, um, that the mind and has a muscle and just, oh, you know, yeah. has many muscles, like you said, the wonder muscle, you know, and, and it can be built and it, it, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an uh, interesting, interesting story that um, I'm a little proud of, but I think it relates here. Um, a, a couple months back, I was, you know, I, I have a marketing company, so I help wellness and like mission driven brands expand their impact through digital marketing and my my first client was my biggest client i spent most of the time on them they were my most revenue by far i liked them the most and there was a mishap and they fired me instantly after three and a half years uh you know why is irrelevant i there was misinformation and it was unfortunate but I got that call, you know, your passion project, your money, you know, <laughs> your, your life for the last three and a half years, just like that instantly gone. Right. And I remember calling my girlfriend right after, I mean, 
right after and saying that, you know, I was like, Hey, you know, this just happened. And like, I can't wait to see what opportunity it brings. And she's so sweet and was, you know, was loving that I was trying to be positive, but she's like, you know, it's okay to feel emotions too. I was like, trust me, like, I will miss it. Like I am sad, but like, I just got half of my time back. No, not back, but I just got half my work time more back in the day. Like, I can start a new business with that. Like, you know, you can do so much with that opportunity. And it, and it was interesting. And that was the first time I realized, because that's something I've always practiced. And I practice it through meditation of, you know, I think about, I think about like trying to recode myself to think like, there's always a positive to everything, you know, practice it through reading and writing. But in the moment, like, I really never experienced, like, you know, I never experienced, like, a sad thought about it. Like, you know, I, like, almost like I had, like, a morning thought, kind of like, you know, like, you know, I'm going to miss some elements of this, but not like a, like, a, I wasn't going down this worrying hole, right? I was kind of just like, you know, this is given to me and done and over with. I didn't have a plan to fight or I tried to kind of fight back once didn't work. So I just dropped it and then decided to like move forward. And, you know, that was the first time I noticed in real time that my muscle was then, then, you know, flexed of trying to look at the bright side of things. It reminds me of that great story I heard about uh, Thomas Edison, the great inventor of the light bulb and other things like that. Um, apparently his lab, which was the most advanced lab in the world, caught fire and burned to the ground. And he got a call that, that it had happened and he ran outside to look and the lab was quite a ways away. So there was nothing he could do about it. And he ran back into the house and he woke up his son and he said, Come outside, Tom, and look. You're never going to see anything like this again in your lifetime. You know, so that was the curious mind at wow. work. You know, if there's nothing I can do about it, let me gaze upon it and wonder. Or our great uh, naturalist from Yosemite Valley out here in California, John Muir, he happened to be camping up in Yosemite in a cave when the great 1906 earthquake happened that devastated San Francisco. And in his notebooks, he said, you know, I felt a great rumbling in the earth and I ran outside to see what I could learn. You know, it's that commitment to learning from every moment. I think that wow. inspires me. I love that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, right. It's like, you know, it's like what it, you're not just assuming something might be might be wrong, right? You're more opening yourself up to possibilities, and it is a it is a commitment. And what I found hard is um, the balance, right? I'm starting, you know, uh, yeah, I've been on this little pseudo psychology philosophy journey for about eight or nine years now. Kind of started in college. And I'm starting to get to a point where I feel pretty clear with my priorities, right? Um, like r being able to start to say no more, you know, that, that's very difficult for me, especially socially, right? You want to see your friends, you want to see your family, but, you know, is that worth passing up, taking that night to read a book and dive into it or, you know, see if you could be, be you know, where, where curiosity peaks for me, Gay, where, so I like to... I like to try to practice these things in the fitness world and then bring them over where curiosity peaks for me is with running. Um, I don't know. I know you mentioned, you know, you do all sorts of exercise. Do you do any like in like long endurance training? Uh, no, I don't because I have a titanium left knee and it doesn't like to be run on. It likes to be walked on briskly, but not run on. Uh, <laughs> but Good for uh, you. I, I really reinvented my body about 12 years ago by starting resistance training with a personal trainer. I yes. am so dedicated that I go three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 a.m. And I'm there on time every time because 
that is so valuable to me. Uh, I started when I was 65 and I I don't look like I looked when I was 65. You know, I, I reinvented my body basically. Uh, and, you know, I have muscles in my shoulders now and I don't have a paunch in the middle. So uh, I, I really <laughs> reinvented things at an age where most people are, you know, probably becoming couch potatoes. That's, I can't tell you how happy that makes me. Like I said, that's an area that, that I just, I love. Re resistance training is, is so critical to body composition, metabolism, and then also just functionality um, in life. Yeah. Um, there's actually, there's actually a really good podcast on longevity out there where somebody talks about Peter Atia talks about, he decides what he wants to be able to do at 95 and understands that we lose 10% of our physical capabilities per decade and backs into that. So he says at 95, I want to be able to carry groceries up three flights of stairs, just five, 10 pounds of groceries. So he then realizes what he needs to be able to do today to make that happen. Um, might be one you like, but so the reason I brought up endurance training, Gay, was I'm starting to be curious about how long I can go with like a run. Um, and it recently went into meditation. I tried to meditate as long as I could. And I, the other day I meditated for about an hour and 10 minutes, which it really felt like I took an eight hour sleep, you know, how refreshed I came out of it. And I don't, I don't, the, the time is, it's not like I did this for an hour and 10 minutes. Now I am happy, right? It's more um, the curiosity. What's it like to meditate that long? What's it like to run that long? Um, and then and that curiosity just, I don't know, it kind of like leads me to to some new things. I really appreciate you you bring that up. Uh, yeah, well, if I may oh, ask, please. what is your uh what is your main sport? Did you have a main sport when you were growing up? Uh basketball and football. Uh, basketball and football. Sport. What position did you play? I was a middle guard on the football team, defense. Really? Yeah. Um, I was a wide receiver in football. And I was like a small forward in basketball. Uh -huh. But How now I'm golfing. You? I'm I'm six foot two, like 205 pounds. Yeah, I'm a golfer too. I'm, uh, I've been as low as a 12.9 handicap, but Ooh. since my knee problems, I'm now a 19.1 handicap. But you have fun with it, don't you? Oh, yeah. I'm a member of the Ojai Valley Inn Golf Club, uh, which is only about five minutes from my house. Um, close enough for me to ride my bicycle over there. And it's one of the best golf courses on the West Coast. I've been a member there for 20 some years now. And uh, it's part of my life every day, just about. You, you play around or just chip and putt and hit the range? And... I played yesterday and I played Tuesday. And often I just <laughs> go over there to hit balls. <laughs> That's outstanding. That is great. We've got a, we got a chance to play. Um, a few courses here in Scotland. Um, I played Carnoustie, which is where the oh. British Open. Um, oh, I know Carnoustie well. It's interesting you should say that. I just had a picture in my mind of Ben Hogan earlier today, of Ben Hogan hitting that shot into the wind at Carnoustie where he had his club way up like this. Uh, look it up on the internet. Just put Ben Hogan at Carnoustie and you'll see what I'm talking about. But yeah, that's I one of the... That's one of the great courses in the world. It, it, we got so lucky. Um, we, we know someone that was able to get us on. Talking about curiosity, yeah, I'm, I'm in Northern Scotland looking over this lake and it's of course raining as it is in Scotland. Beautiful rainbow just appeared over the lake. <laughs> I'll, uh, there, I'm gonna take a picture and I'll share it with you. It's the magic of this discussion today. Um, Good, uh, sometime look up the poem, Scotland by, I believe it's Alistair Reed. Um, it's a wonderful poem about a beautiful day in Scotland. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to it. I look forward to it. Um, Gay, I, I, a question that I, I, I wanted to make sure that 
I was, I asked was, I want to know what is, I don't want to say cliche term. I want to know what's next for you, but I, I want to know like what, what's, are you most excited about right now? Mm. And you know, that you want to work on what's got you stoked. Yeah. Well, all summer long, I've been working on finishing the editing process of several mystery novels. I don't know if you know this, but I write mystery novels in my spare time. I have a whole bunch of mystery novels out there on uh, Amazon and other places if you wanna look them up. Uh, some of them have to do with a Tibetan Buddhist private detective. Um, and some of them have to do with a London dandy of a hundred and some years ago, um, but they're detective novels. But anyway, I was finishing the editing process of several of those that will be the last ones I do in those series. And I was actually finishing the editing process on a memoir that I've written, uh, Stories from My Life. And I'm finishing that. And so I'm finished wow. finished with my literary work for the summer. And now I'm just kind of polishing up various things. And uh, I also, oh, I have a big, uh, big thing coming up in October where I'm going to do a one day event for, I don't know if it's a hundred, hundreds or thousands of people, but there's a lot of people uh, that I'll be teaching a whole bunch of things like this to all day long. So I'm getting all the materials and ready for that. Uh, Katie and I will be in Where Maui. Where is that? Uh, it's on the internet. It's a, a virtual thing. It's through the Brave Thinking Institute. Great, great. And, and you're going to Katie Maui. I, yeah, Katie and I uh, spent 10 days in Maui. Uh, it's kind of a home away from home for us over the past 30 years. And we have this one favorite hotel that we love there. And so uh, we spent 10 days there back in December and we liked it so much. Uh, we're going uh, we're going back again uh, soon. So um, looking forward to that. It, it, it seriously fills my heart that when I ask that, it's almost like, how do I filter this answer down versus <laughs> yeah. how do I dig? I'll tell you, one of the, you know, sometimes your body just knows what's right and what's wrong. And one of the worst sensations I feel in my body is when I hear someone say that they're bored. It makes me, want, I, it, yeah. it's, it, it I, makes me emotional. Me I too. I cannot, I cannot imagine being bored. I, I haven't uh, spent a bored day in my life. Speaking of which, you and I need to wrap our conversation up because we've got people breathing down my neck at the top of the hour. And uh, so I want to uh, find out anything else, any other way I can serve you before I vanish off into the pixelated atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gay, well, um, I just nothing I, you know i just want to to thank you again for for joining and i appreciate you know you diving into these different topics sharing your wisdom um a, a lot of this you've spent a lot of your energy what even though you've enjoyed it to cultivate the knowledge and experiences you've had and because of that you know the and the, because of the fact that it was all intentional you know, this is, you know, your life's work and it's, it's a treasure. And I just, you, you know, so openly shared it with me and my audience. And I thank you for that. I, I look forward to repaying you, if you will, and um, staying connected with you as well. Please do and have a good rest of your day in Scotland. Oh, thank you so much, Gay. Have a great one. Hey, thank you for watching today's episode. If you got something out of this, it would mean so much if you could just take a second and give us a rating on whatever platform you're watching it on. And it would mean so much to the world if you could just find one person that you think this message resonates with and you can share that with them. Thank you so much for your support. Looking forward to share the next episode with you.